presentation you are about to hear is both profound and practical at the same time. Dr. Bakioki will outline seven ways in which the Sabbath can help us experience the awareness of Christ's presence, peace, and rest in our lives. This is a timely, Christ-centered presentation designed to help us appreciate more fully the blessings of the Sabbath. Once again, Dr. Samuel Bakioki. Welcome, friends, to the third session of our Sabbath Enrichment Seminar. In the previous two presentations, I shared with you, first of all, the story of the Sabbath in my life, how the Lord opened the door for me to enter, study, research, and publish the Sabbath inside the Vatican. And then we explore together how on and through the Sabbath we can serve God, ourselves, and others. In this third presentation, we like to look into the Sabbath and the Savior. This is a very vital study because often Sabbatarians are accused of making the Sabbath their Savior. And in this presentation, we want to see how the Sabbath enables us to experience the presence, the peace, and the rest of Christ in our life. This meditation is taken from the sixth chapter of my book, where I present the major seven points of this meditation. By way of introduction, I'd like to remind all of us that we live today intensively active, stressful, rushing lifestyle. I don't know if you know what rush hour is, but you know, I often in Los Angeles, I was there last weekend, and I'm going to be back there in two weeks time, and on Friday afternoon, when I arrived there, the freeways are not free anymore. <laughs> From LA airport to go to Glendale, a half an hour ride, it has taken me up to three hours. And it's interesting to see how the rush hour are experienced in different ways in different parts of the world. In America, the freeway becomes congested. When you go to the Far East in a country like Vietnam, they are congested not with cars, but with people trying to get home with their bicycle, with their trolley, with whatever means of transportation they have. And this kind of life on the rush contributes to many problems. There are many people today that are stressed out, burnt out. Time magazine tells us that the best-selling drugs in America today are all stress, tension-related drugs. In order to experience release from their tension, from their stress, people take pills, drugs, alcohol, vacation to a fantasy island, hoping to forget it all, hoping to regain the balance, the equilibrium of our being. But experience tells us that true rest and peace is not a human achievement, it's a divine gift. It's a gift that we experience when we allow our Savior to harmonize the mental, the physical, and spiritual components of our being. The great influential spiritual leader Augustine stated this truth so eloquently in his autobiography known as Confession when he says, Thou, God, hast made us for thyself, and our hearts are restless until they find rest in thee. The question is, why do we need divine assistance to experience rest, peace in our life? I believe that the answer is to be found in the fact that perfect rest and peace does not come about accidentally, but is the result of the harmonious accord of the mental, physical, and spiritual components of our being. May I ask you, can you, can I, can we by ourselves harmonize these three, the mental, physical, and spiritual components of our being? I'm afraid not. If we are stressed out, Uh, We may place ourselves on a bed, but if we are, you know, internally agitated, stressed out, you will find we don't have peace. We have agitation. We turn and twist around without experiencing real peace. Peace. I find that like the various components of an orchestra need the maestro, we call it maestro in Italian, a conductor to, to uh, blame the various parts so they can produce harmonious music. So uh, our own life, the mental, physical, and spiritual components of our being need the direction of our master and savior, Jesus Christ. He's the only one that can bring harmony to our life. The question is how do we allow the 
Savior to harmonize our life, the Bible tells us that God has given us a very unique institution, the Sabbath day, the day which is designed to liberate us, to free us from work, so that we can allow our Savior to work in us more fully and more freely. How does the Sabbath bring Christ rest to our life? The scripture suggests seven ways in which genuine Sabbath keeping enable us to experience the presence, the peace, and the rest of Christ in our life. And we like to explore these seven points together very quickly. The first way in which the Sabbath brings Christ rest to our life is by reassuring us that our life has meaning, has value, has hope, because it's rooted in God from creation to eternity. We may call this the rest of creation. This is the rest that many thinking persons are looking today. There are many people out there who are very disillusioned by their linear, meaningless existence. They are asking, where do I come from? Why I'm here? Where am I going? And many of them have no answer. They are not very excited about about this uh, theory of evolution that proposes that we originated by chance, spontaneously, and that our great, great ancestors were lower creatures like monkey. You know, to, to think, think that, that our great, great grandfather was a monkey, that, that is nothing to brag about, isn't it true? And so many want to find meaning in their life by tracing their family tree, hoping not to find the monkey, but to find the prince, uh, a president, a scientist, some kind of a genius so they can say, you know what, I have some special blood flowing through my vein. I remember our family tree, my father was very proud of it. And when I was looking at all the branches, Bacchiocchi Cardinal, Bacchiocchi Bishop, and Bacchiocchi Pope, Mamma Mia, I said, I must have holy blood flowing through my vein with so many prestigious, you know, church leaders in my family tree. But let me reassure you this morning that through the Sabbath, the Savior gives gives us a much greater assurance. He reassures that our, our roots are good. Why? Because they are rooted in God from creation to eternity. Through the Sabbath, the Savior tells us that we are not the product of chance, but the product of choice, the choice of a living, loving creator. I find this beautiful message of the Sabbath in the creation story. You know, there are three significant literary devices which are used to help us appreciate this message of perfect creation. What are they? The use of the number seven, the emphatic use of key words, and the imagery of God's rest. Let me take a moment to explain each one of them. Did you know that the whole creation story is structured in seven and multiple of seven? The creation story itself is divided in seven parts. It's divided by the phrase, it was evening, it was morning, day one, evening, morning, day two. And, but not only the story is divided in seven parts, many of the details of the story are given in seven a multiple of seven. Genesis 1.1 1, 1 has seven words in, in the Hebrew, that is in the Hebrew Bible. Genesis 1.2 has 14 words, two times seven. The term God, Elohim, occurs 35 times, five times seven. The term earth, Ahares, occurs 21 times in the creation story, three times seven. The word heavens occurs 21 times, three times seven. Light, seven times. It was good, seven time, the last time, very good. Now, why is the number seven used to structure the creation narrative and to give so many of the details? The reason is simple, to emphasize the function of the Sabbath as the symbol of the perfection and completion of God's creation. You know what I found in my research, that in the, in the ancient Near East, in the ancient world, People use the number seven to express completion, perfection. If a young man wanted to reassure the, his girlfriend that he was really serious, that he was, wanted, was prepared to make a total commitment to marry her, he would repeat seven times, I love you, number one, I love you twice, I love you three times, I love you four times, I love you five times, I love you, three, I love you seven times. And if he repeated seven times, there was no doubt he meant business. So you ladies, if you have a doubt about the commitment of your suitor, why don't you ask him to repeat it seven times? And if he does it, then you have nothing to worry about. Now, 
It's interesting to notice even the use of key words to, 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 uh, to in the account of the establishment of the Sabbath. You remember in Genesis chapter 2, 2 and 3, where it said, in the seventh day God finished this work which he had done, and he rested from all the work which he had done, and he blessed the seventh day and hallowed the seventh day for all the work which he had done. If you read those two verses, there's a lot of repetition. An English teacher here at Andrews would mark down that, that literary style, too many repetition. But in the Hebrew style, if something was important, had to be repeated three times. And which are the key words which are repeated three times? God, seven day, work, done. Those four words in those two verses are repeated three times because they are fundamental to the meaning of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is the day when God on the seventh day considered his work done, done, done. That means it was done. You know, as a teacher many times I repeated important points in my class here at Andrews where I taught for 26 years three times and I would tell the students listen now I repeat it three times if you miss it in your quiz you have to say mea culpa mea culpa mea massima culpa it's my fault my fault is only my fault because the teacher has repeated three times what more could he do and so God leaves us without excuse he repeats three times that on and through the Sabbath he considered his work perfect completed there is also the imagery of God's rest to dramatize the fact that through the Sabbath God viewed his, his creation complete we are told that God rested. Now the word rest in English uh, suggests uh, relaxation, but that's not the meaning of the Hebrew word there in Genesis. The word used is Shabbat. Shabbat doesn't mean to relax. Shabbat, Shabbat means to rest, to stop, to desist from doing other activity. In other words, the rest of God in the creation story is a rest of cessation. When we go to the Sabbath commandment, we find that the rest of God is a newer rest, which is an anthropological rest. It's a kind of a human rest. God rests as an example, model for us in the commandment. But in the creation story, the rest of God is cosmological. What does it mean? It's a message about the cosmos, the universe. God wants us to know that he was happy, he was satisfied by having completed per perfectly his creation. There was no need for, for, what shall I say, improvement, some finishing touches. He was happy, so he stopped. You know, whenever we are satisfied with the term paper or any project, we come to the point where we say, this is it, I think I have done it now, I'm going to stop. And so the rest of God is a rest that reassures us that God's creation was perfect. And God took time to celebrate his creation with the first human couple, Adam and Eve. To celebrate the Sabbath means to experience in a special way Christ's restful assurance that our lives have meaning, our lives have value, because they are rooted in God from creation to eternity. On the Sabbath, we experience Christ's creation rest by delighting in the beauty and in the goodness of God's creation. A second way in which the Sabbath brings Christ's rest to our life is by enabling us to experience in a special way the awareness of Christ's presence in our life. It was Christ's presence that stilled the troubled water of the Sea of Galilee and brought reassurance to the troubled disciples. And it is the awareness of Christ's presence that brings calm and peace to our life. May I propose to you that this is the essence of the holiness of the Sabbath. If we were to ask the question, what is it that makes the Sabbath holy? Not the structure of the day. After all, the Sabbath is a 24-hour day like the rest of the weekdays. What is it that makes the Sabbath holy? I believe what makes the Sabbath holy is God's promise that on and through this day, He is willing to manifest in a special way His presence in our life. It is the presence of God, you remember, that makes a place holy. You remember Moses was told to remove his sandals because the place was holy. Holy. Why was it holy there? Not because there was a sanctuary, but 
Sabbath because God's presence was manifested there. You know, it's because the Sabbath is the day when God's presence is manifested in our life in a special way. This is what makes the Sabbath a sanctuary in time. This is what makes the Sabbath a portable sanctuary, a sanctuary that God's people have been able to carry with them wherever they went. You remember when the Jews were taken into exile in Babylon? They could not take with them the temple. They could not take with them, you know, their, their worshiping places. They could only carry the Sabbath. The Sabbath was their portable sanctuary. And there in Babylon, by the riverside, under a tree, they came together on the Sabbath. And the Sabbath became their sanctuary in time. This is how the synagogue began, by the way. The word synagogue, sunagoge, means gathering together. It was the gathering together on the Sabbath of God's people, wherever they could find a convenient place that gave origin to the synagogue, which is the forerunner of the Christian church. Yes, the Sabbath has been a portable sanctuary in my life. I spent six summers working as a literature evangelist, a colporter on the Adriatic Riviera. I remember those summers. I was away from home, away from a church. I was very much alone. I was staying with an uncle and an aunt, devout Catholic people that were trying to brainwash me and to bring me back to the Catholic fold. During the week, I had to face a lot of opposition. I remember, you know, I had to face the hostility of the priest and the police. I always started canvassing at the very end of town so that I would have a bit of time, you know, to do some canvassing before reaching the main square where the cathedral and the rector is located. Sometimes I managed to cover a whole town without being caught by the priest or the police, but sometimes people became suspicious about me, so they sent, a, there were no telephones in those days, very few of them at least, so they would send a boy or a girl to the priest, say, you know what, we think that there is a Protestant heretic, you know, distributing literature in the town, why don't you call the police, and the police would come with their, with their moto Gucci, with their motorbike, I only had a little scooter, no way for me to compete with them, you know, and they would catch me, and they would grab me by the arm, and they would pound me how many times do we have to tell you that you are not supposed to distribute unauthorized literature please give me the permission then I'll do it without any trouble but they would not do it that was the only way I could do it and let me tell you when Friday night came I said thank God it is Sabbath so for one day I could forget the hostile world around me. I was by myself. The closest church was 60 miles away and I could not travel that far on the Sabbath. Very expensive. So I was by myself. I would go out on the beach, on a field. I was by myself. Lone, alone, yes, but never felt lonely because the Sabbath brought me the reassurance of God's presence in my life. Indeed, for many people who have been, you know, deprived by prison bars or by circumstances from worshiping with fellow believers, the Sabbath has been the day when they have experienced in a special way in the solitude of their soul the presence of God. A third way in which the Sabbath brings uh, Christ rest to our life is by releasing us from the pressure of competition, the pressure of production. We live in a very competitive society today. In order to compete uh, today and to reach the, the executive ladder, yes, we have to compete in school, we have to compete in business, and we also have to compete in the global market. Just a couple of months ago, I was in Singapore. I found that the whole economy of Singapore is based on international production and competition. And the, whole, the ultimate goal of competition, obviously, is to make more money. But, you know, competition can, can sometimes uh, dishearten, it can demoralize people. I found that sometimes while I was teaching here, you know, some of the students would, uh, would come into my class for a day or two just to see how stiff was the competition. If they saw that there were quite a number of Koreans or, or Filipinos or Jamaicans, bright a student they would say dr Bakyoki, i would really love to take your class but i think it's going to be hard for me to get an a in this class there are too many bright students so i better wait until another time isn't it true so competition can dishearten can demoralize but i have good news for you and sometimes People, in order to compete with their neighbor, to have like them, you know, two cars in the garage and two Worthington chicken in the pot, you know, the moonlight even on God's holy day. You know, when I heard about moonlighting, 
I thought it was a romantic activity. <laughs> you know, coming from the romantic country of Italy, I said, mamma mia, this America must be very romantic people because there are so many of them I understand that are moonlighting. But then people explained to me that moonlighting is not necessarily romanticism, but is a second or a third job that people will hold in order to earn more and more and never be satisfied. And this is where the Sabbath comes in. God has given us the Sabbath to teach our greedy hearts to be grateful. When the Sabbath comes is Shabbat. What does Shabbat mean? Time to stop, as I told you before. Time to stop being greedy. Time to start counting the blessing. I like to think of the Sabbath as our weekly Thanksgiving celebration. You know, you Americans are lucky. You have the annual Thanksgiving celebration, which very few countries have, by the way. It's beautiful that you as a country and as a people, once a year, take time to express your gratitude to God for the blessing received. But we as Adventists have the age because we have the weekly Thanksgiving celebration. Every week we can stop to count the blessing received during the week which has gone by. And so a grateful heart is the abiding place of the peace of God. The Sabbath invites us not to compete but to commune with one another. On the Sabbath we come together not to compete but to fellowship with one another. If brother and sister Smith live on social security. During the week we may, we may be tempted to think of them in terms of their small paycheck of social security, but when we worship with them on the Sabbath and we see how much they are contributing, you know, to the life of the church and to the community, we think of them not quantitatively in terms of the little money that they make, but qualitatively in terms of their contribution to the church and to the community. Indeed, the Sabbath invites us to look at the world through the eyes of eternity. A fourth way in which the Sabbath brings Christ rest and peace to our life is by reassuring us of our belonging to the Savior. You know, at the root of much unhappiness, of much restlessness, there is the sense of not belonging to anyone or to anything. I discover it even in my teaching. Sometimes I found there are students, there were students who were not performing well. And when I sat down to talk with them in my office, sometimes I discovered that one of the problems, that they had no sense of belonging. They came from broken homes. They felt very much lonely in life. They did not have the sense of worth, the kind of motivation that comes from, you know, parental support that would give them a sense of worth, a sense of identity. Indeed, it is in a mutual belonging relationship that we experience love, identity, and security. What I find interesting that in the history of salvation, God has used various signs and symbols to help us conceptualize and experience a belonging relationship. The Bible speaks of the rainbow, the circumcision, the Passover lamb and blood, the baptism and the Lord's Supper. If you take time to study, these are all signs of a belonging relationship. They are all designed, so to speak, to experience our commitment, our belonging to the Lord. But you know what? The Sabbath is unique. Among all the God-given signs of belonging, the Sabbath stands out. Why? It's unique in its origin because it's the first one that was given to the human family. It's unique in its survival because it has survived the fall, the flood, the Egyptian slavery. It has survived the Roman anti-Sabbath legislation of the Emperor Hadrian. We are going to study about it in the fifth lecture. It has survived the 10 days introduction, the the 10 the week introduction during the French and Russian Revolution, it has survived the humanism, evolutionist skepticism. The Sabbath is still the sign that uh, helps us to experience a belonging relationship with God. Indeed, the Sabbath is unique in its function because it has functioned as the sign par excellence of the divine election and, uh, and the mission of God's people. We read that in Ezekiel. I gave them my Sabbath as a sign between me and them that they might know that I, the Lord, sanctify them. You know what? I took time to examine that word sanctify to get to the deeper meaning. You know what I found? That the word sanctify in Hebrew is lekadesh. Lekadesh is the term that was used to describe the engagement of a woman to a man. When a woman was engaged, when she had made her commitment to live 
with her beloved, she was sanctified. What does it mean? She had set herself apart. She had committed herself, you know, to live in the presence of her love. And it's beautiful to see that the Lord has chosen the Sabbath as the sign of this engagement, of this commitment. The question is why? Why has God chosen the Sabbath, which is a day, which is time? May I make three suggestions? First of all, I believe because time is the essence of our life. The way we use our time is indicative of our priorities. Isn't it true? You know, if you don't care for somebody, you just say to the person, I'm sorry, but I don't have time. If one of the guys calls you, ladies, offering to take you out for a Saturday night date, and let us imagine that you met the guy in the classroom, in the dining room, in the student center, you did not get a very good impression. In fact, your feeling that he's a kind of, what do you call it, weirdo? Is that what the word that you use? You think that he's a very strange fellow. What are you going to tell him? Thank you for calling. You know what? I think I need to hit the books on Saturday night. I have four major tests coming up on Monday. By the way, this would be a sign of the time if the students would hit the books on Saturday night. Don't you think so? But if the fellow that calls you is the very guy that you have been dreaming about, what are you going to tell the fellow? That you are going to hit the books? Absolutely not. Well, you know, I should be studying, but because of you, Let's go out, have a good time. What is the point I'm trying to make? When we love somebody, when we care for somebody, even if we are plenty busy, we take time, we make time for that person. That is why I believe the Sabbath is so important because when you and I give priority to God on the Sabbath, we show in a concrete, tangible way that God really counts in our life. A second reason why I believe that the Lord has chosen the Sabbath as a sign of belonging, a sign of sanctification, is because time is universal, is accessible to everybody. And through time, God can gather his people without leaving out anyone. We may not be equal as far as money. If we were to compare our, our bank account, some of you may have much more money than I have, but we are equal when it comes to time. Uh, your day is 24 hours like my day. We have the same time. And you know what? Through the Sabbath, we don't have to make pilgrimages to Jerusalem or to Rome or to the Mecca to show our commitment to God because the Sabbath comes and visits us wherever we are. This is very beautiful. You know, one of the things I noticed that to celebrate the various annual feasts, people needed a lot of objects to celebrate Passover. They needed the Passover lamb, the unleavened bread, the bitter herbs. But you know what? To celebrate the Sabbath, there is no object that is needed. The only thing that is needed is a heart that loves the Lord. Isn't it beautiful, this picture of the heart carved into the commandment? Because the essence of God's commandment are expression of love to the Lord. It is all what it takes to honor the Savior on the Sabbath. No object, only a heart that loves the Lord. A third suggestion I would like to make for the divine choice of the Sabbath as a sign of sanctification, as a sign of belonging, is that time is incorruptible. It does not deteriorate. The Sabbath of Adam, the Sabbath of Jesus, your Sabbath, my Sabbath is still the same 24-hour Sabbath. Ideas which are attached to object, material object, in the course of time deteriorate like the object themselves. I come from Rome. We Romans are very proud of all the monuments of antiquity. The Colosseum perhaps stands out as the most imposing dog monument of antiquity. But let me tell you something. If you were to ask 100 Romans, could you tell me please who built the Colosseum and why? I assure you that 99% would say, don't ask me. I haven't got a clue. We are very proud of all of those monuments, but the truth is that we know very little about them. But the Sabbath is not a relic of antiquity. The Sabbath is always fresh because it invites us all the time throughout human history to experience in a fresh way every week the awareness of the presence of the peace of God in our lives. A fifth reason why I believe God has chosen the Sabbath you know, to help us experience Christ's rest and peace in our life is because a very vital function of the Sabbath is to break down social, racial, 
and cultural tension. You know, at the root of so much tension today, there is the unwillingness to accept another person's race, religion, or culture. If you think for a moment about all of this war on terrorism, what is it at the root of it? Is the unwillingness of some fanatical Muslim to accept uh, the, what they call the infidels, those who profess you know, a different faith, a different religion. And you know what I found in my research that a very vital function of the Sabbath throughout human history has been to break down the social, racial, and religious barrier. Every seven days on the weekly Sabbath, every seven years on the sabbatical year, every seven weeks of years on the Jubilee year, the Sabbath was the great liberator of the Hebrew society. Did you know that every seven years, and also seven weeks of years on the Jubilee year, that all the deaths were cancelled? Wouldn't it be nice to have a sabbatical year today when you could, uh, you could uh, wipe out all your debts and tell to your creditor, please send the bills up stairs. God will take care of them. Wouldn't be nice. And you know, by the way, the New Testament concept of forgiveness, aphesis, comes from the sabbatical uh, release of indebtedness. You remember in the Lord's Prayer where Jesus says, forgive our debts. That refers to the indebtedness that was forgiven, you know, in the sabbatical and jubilee year that become the symbol of the uh, release from our spiritual indebtedness. But the Sabbath was the great liberator of the Hebrew society because every seven years. If you sold yourself in slavery to pay the debt that you couldn't pay because you could not borrow any money from the bank, when the sabbatical year came, you were entitled to be free again. Your property was restored. So the Sabbath was the great liberator. <coughs> Isaiah reassures the foreigner, the outcast of which the Babylonian Assyrian war had made a great number, that if they would keep the Sabbath, he says that God will make you joyful, for my house shall be called the house of prayer for all people. Yes, the Sabbath summons us to accept and respect one another. You know, when we come together to worship on the Sabbath, the moment when we are more responsive to God, we are summoned to accept everyone, whether a person is black or white, whether a person is rich or poor, whether a person is educated or not educated. The Sabbath challenges us to accept everybody because on the Sabbath we acknowledge the fatherhood of God, the brotherhood of man, and consequently the Sabbath teaches to accept everybody as a son and daughter of God. A sixth way in which the Sabbath brings Christ's rest to our life is by enabling us through the physical rest to conceptualize, internalize the reality of the spiritual rest of salvation. You know, this was the most rewarding, enriching discovery that I made in all this research on the Sabbath. I was not aware of this connection between the Sabbath and the Savior. I became aware that God's willingness to enter into human time at creation is a kind of a prelude to his willingness to enter into human flesh at redemption. I became aware of the fact all of a sudden that in the Old Testament, the Sabbath pointed to the Savior to come. And in the New Testament, the Sabbath celebrates the salvation that the Savior has provided. What I like to do very quickly, because time is very limited, I want to mention three specific Old Testament messianic themes that were represented by the Sabbath. First of all, the Sabbath rest. You know, you and I today, when we think of the Sabbath rest, we think of it more in terms of personal rest, personal renewal, relaxation. But I want you to know something that in the history of God's people, in Old Testament time, the Sabbath rest had three levels of meaning. First of all, it was personal rest, no question about it. But then it also became the symbol of rest in the promised land. There are many passages where it says the Lord, that in Deuteronomy is going to bring you to the land of rest, will give you rest from your enemy, your king will be a man of rest. And Solomon, when he inaugurates the temple, he says, God, come down to the house of rest that I have built you, find, resting, uh, find the rest 
resting place among your people. It's beautiful to see how the whole concept of the Sabbath rest helped them to maintain alive the hope of one day entering the promised land, the land of rest. But since this never fully materialized, then the Sabbath became the symbol of the Messianic rest, the Messiah to come. There are many, many passages in, in, in Jewish literature where the Messiah to come was expected to be uh, a kind of a Sabbath liberator. He was expected to bring rest to the people. In fact, the Messianic age is often described as the age of everlasting rest. This helps us to understand why Jesus, in Matthew 11, 28, you know, offered his, come unto me and I will give you rest. He was not acting as a union leader. He says, if you vote for me, I'm going to be sure that you sh your week is shortened to 40 hours so you have more time, less time to work, less working time and more time to rest. No, Jesus was making a messianic proclamation. You have been looking forward to, to the Messiah to come as the Sabbath rest, the Sabbath liberator. I have good news for you. I am your Sabbath liberator. And it's beautiful to notice not only the Sabbath rest, but even the sabbatical structure of time served to measure the time to the coming of the Messiah. This is something new for me. When I, when I became aware of it, I was really excited about it. Notice, for example, in Daniel chapter 9, 24 and 25, you remember what it says, that 70 weeks in Hebrew, Shabuim, 70 sabbatical cycles are determined until when? You know, it says, until the coming of the anointed one to finish transgression, to atone for iniquity. Here we have the Sabbath that is used, a sabbatical structure of time that is used to measure the time to the coming of the Messiah. So this is very interesting. And also the Sabbath liberation, being a day of liberation, the weekly Sabbath, the annual Sabbath, the Jubilee Sabbath, this served to, so to speak, to epitomize, to symbolize, to represent the mission of the Messiah as the great liberator. Do you remember this beautiful passage in Isaiah 61 to the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted, to proclaim liberty to the captive, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, which is the acceptable year of the Lord. It was the sabbatical year, the year when the Sabbath became the liberator of the human, of the Hebrew society. And it's beautiful to see that Jesus began his ministry in the synagogue of Nazareth, reading this very passage, the passage that described the Messiah to come as the great Sabbath liberator. And after having read that passage, uh, you know, he turned the scroll, he found it, he read it, and then he preached a short sermon. Luke 4, 21, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Isn't it beautiful? Jesus basically said that all what the Sabbath promised to you in terms of rest and redemption today, as I'm here ready to begin my ministry, this is becoming a reality for the first time. And if we were to take time to examine all the Sabbath ministry of Jesus, what do you find? You find that on the Sabbath, Jesus intensified his redemptive ministry, bringing physical and spiritual liberation to needy people. There are seven Sabbath healing episodes reported in the gospel. And remember that all those episodes were not on, be on behalf of... Um, of emergency people. They were all people that could have waited for an extra day. Paralytic for 38 years, blind from death, bent low for 18 years. They were all chronically sick people. But Jesus acted intentionally to make the Sabbath the day of liberation. You know, the, my favorite story, my favorite Sabbath episode is the one in Luke chapter 13, 10 to 17, the healing of the crippled lady. Do you remember this woman that for 18 years was bent low? She couldn't stand straight. He had to twist her neck to look at the preacher on the Sabbath. When Jesus saw her, what did he say? Woman, you are free from your infirmity. And the verb free, by the way, is used three times. Second time in reference to the ruler of the city. He got upset because for him the Sabbath was rules to obey, not people to love. What did Jesus tell him? You hypocrite. That is not a compliment, is it? When you call somebody a hypocrite. Don't you lose your animal on the Sabbath? Why did they lose? The, why did they free their animal? That is a second usage. Because if they didn't drink any water, uh, so you use the animal to bring them to the water in trough. If they didn't drink in the hot climate of Palestine, they became dehydrated. They lost market value. You are very concerned about any financial loss. 
that you incur if you don't water your animal. What about this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound law for 18 years? Should she be loosed on the Sabbath day? <laughs> Isn't it beautiful? Three times Jesus used the verb luo, luo, luo in Greek. And when that lady that was healed on the Sabbath went back to church the following Sabbath, standing straight, singing the Psalms of David, don't you think that she came to celebrate the Sabbath? as the memorial of her redemption, the memorial of her physical and spiritual restoration. Yes, Jesus began his ministry on the Sabbath. Jesus intensified his ministry on the Sabbath. Jesus completed his ministry. On a Friday afternoon, what did he say? It is finished. Creation was completed with the rest of God. Redemption was completed with the rest of the Savior in the tomb. And the rest of the Savior in the tomb for me is a tremendous revelation of God's love. It tells me that God so loved the world that he was willing to enter not only in the limitation of human time at creation, but also in the suffering, agony, uh, death of human flesh at the incarnation in order to become Emmanuel, God with us. So, in the light of the cross, the Sabbath rest that remains for the people of God is a time to celebrate not only God's creative, but also God's redemptive love. A seventh way in which the Sabbath brings Christ's rest to our life is by providing with time and opportunity to serve. This was our previous meditation on the ta Sabbath as a time of service. We notice how on and through the Sabbath we serve God, ourselves and others. We serve God by giving priority to God in our thinking and in our living. We serve ourselves by experiencing mental, physical, and spiritual renewal. We serve others by coming closer to our family members, marital partner, and needy people. Well, we have noticed this morning how the Sabbath is Christ's weekly invitation to come to him and find rest in him. We have noticed how through the Sabbath we can experience Christ's creation rest, the restful assurance that our life has meaning, our life has hope, because it's rooted in God from creation to eternity. We have noticed that through the Sabbath we can experience the awareness of Christ's presence in our life. We have noticed that through the Sabbath we can experience Christ rest from competition because the Sabbath teaches us not to compete but to commune with one another. We have noticed that through the Sabbath we experience the sense of belonging because the Sabbath is indeed the badge of our commitment, of our belonging to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Through the Sabbath, we experience Christ to rest from social tension because on this day, the Lord teaches us to accept and respect everybody, irrespective of their race, of their color, of their culture, and of their religion. Through the Sabbath, we experience in a special way the rest of redemption. You know, we need the physical rest in order to apprehend the spiritual rest. We are going to discuss this afternoon. Some of the former Sabbatarians would like us to believe that we do not need this, the literal Sabbath rest because we can experience the rest of salvation every day. What is fundamentally flawed with that kind of reasoning that through the physical we apprehend the spiritual. By stopping our work, we allow the Savior to work in us more fully and more freely. And uh, through the Sabbath, we can experience the rest of service by being able to come closer to our family member, uh, to our uh, uh, marital partner and the needy people. May the Sabbath become for us the day when we allow the Savior to enrich our lives with his presence, peace and rest. May the Sabbath truly become the day when we celebrate in a special way God's creative and redemptive love. May the Sabbath become the day when we stop our work to allow our Savior to work in us more fully so that we can enjoy and experience in a fuller and freer way the presence, the peace, and the rest of Christ in our lives. This is my prayer for each one of us this morning. Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Thank you, O God, for the opportunity we had this morning in this hour of worship to explore afresh and anew how on and through the Sabbath we can experience the awareness of the presence, the peace, and the rest of Christ in our life. We will pray, O oh God, that indeed 
we may respond to Christ's invitation to come to him every Sabbath and experience his rest and peace in our life. May the Sabbath become for us a day of joyful celebration of thy creative and redemptive love. May the Sabbath become for us the day when we draw closer to thee and closer to one another, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen.